God has made us in his image, and that includes having emotions. Because as we see in the Bible, God has emotions. We see him laughing. We see him, we see Jesus weeping. Uh, we see the righteous anger of God. We see God having regret. All these different emotions. And so the fact that we have emotions is actually because we are made in the image of God. So today I'm going to go more in depth of how to actually manage those emotions, manage them the godly way. Because one of the biggest areas that the devil tries to come and shape and change someone's identity in Christ and also the big way that he comes to try to lead a person astray and get them to do what he wants to do. One of the big ways is as is him coming in the emotions, him intruding in your emotions, influencing your emotions, um, tricking people in their emotions, uh, deceiving them. So this managing your emotions the godly way is so important, is so key to being in God's will, to keeping doors shut to the devil. Ephesians 4.24, it says to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The Amplified Version says put on the new self, the regenerated and renewed nature created in God's image, God-like the righteousness and holiness of the truth, living in a way that expresses to God your gratitude for your salvation. So it says, put on your new self, created in God's image. So meaning your new self is what's made in God's image. Your old self has so much influence by the devil you need to put on a new self, which is the image of God. And so what your new self is, is looking like God, is feeling like how God feels, is having the appropriate emotions and not letting the devil ever come and influence your emotions, give you wrong emotions and lead you somewhere with those emotions. But as you're feeling things, knowing whether to reject the emotions because they're recognizing they're coming from the devil or whether to uh, realize this is a godly emotion. Like even God is feeling this right now and I'm feeling this right now because we are one and this is his heart and I'm having his heart for the situation. And so you embrace that emotion. You don't suppress that emotion. You embrace it and you look to God with what to do with that emotion and, and how to make sure the devil doesn't come and thwart it, come and try to steal the beautiful thing that God is doing in your heart, in your emotions. I want to take you through different examples of different kinds of emotions and just give you practical examples in this message for certain emotions you're having so you can know how to deal with them. So you can so you know how to recognize this emotion is from God. This emotion is is being influenced by the devil. So in Genesis six, verse six, the Nephilim were on the earth at this time. There was so much wickedness um, and there was so much evil. Humanity had become so evil at this point in Genesis. And this is right before God brought the flood and only preserved Noah and his family and the animals, but destroyed the rest of humanity. So God created that humanity, but then God, it says in Genesis six, verse six, regretted, actually regretted uh, creating, making the humans. So it says, verse six, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth, the human race I've created and with them, the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I have made them. So we see this emotion of regret and also his heart was deeply troubled. So that means that 
to have regret and our heart to be troubled at times is okay. And during our process of being transformed fully into the image of God, there will be mistakes sometimes. And when you recognize those mistakes, when you see that that wasn't really God's will, when you see that maybe you fell short, disappointed God, didn't do what he had asked, you know, when that happens, one should feel regret. One should feel, I wish I didn't do this. My heart is troubled that I did this. My heart is troubled that I didn't please God. Our hearts, our, our biggest passion should be to please God, to touch God's heart, to obey God. When I talk about obeying God and, you know, where our hearts should be, I always love to include those words, touch God's heart, um, you know, love him the way he wants to be loved, Beca rather than just obey because People can do that in a legalistic, religious way. I must obey God. But we should have the heart of obedience is God's love language. It's what touches his heart the most. I'm obeying him because I love him so much. And I want to touch his heart. I want to please him. I want to make him full of joy and happy and delighted more so, <laughs> I want that. So that's why I obey him, because I love him, because he loves me so much and I love him. That's why I obey. Right? So that's our, what our biggest passion should be, is to touch God's heart, please him, um, make him proud, obey him. So when that is your biggest passion, as it should be, and you should renew your mind to that truth, you know, that's who I want to be. That's me. I want to please God more than anything. Even when you're not feeling it, speak these things aloud. Meditate on this that you want until your heart, your soul catches up to what you have decided by obedience to God, by following the Holy Spirit, placing the spirit man at the head of this spirit soul body rather than the soul and body um, controlling. The soul doesn't feel like obeying God, so then the rest of the body follows and doesn't obey. No, we don't want that. We want the spirit to be at the head, which is doing what God wants. Okay, so when that is your biggest passion, to please God, to touch his heart, that means that if you don't do that, well, first of all, it means that that's where you're gonna be most of the time, if not all the time, because You've made that your biggest passion, desire, intention in your life. So it's hard to miss the mark when you really made that your biggest passion, intention, desire, goal. Amen. And that also means that if you do miss the mark, if you do make a mistake, because you've made that the most important thing in your life, in your heart, you've decided, that means that you're gonna feel bad. And this is where conviction comes. This is where this is a godly emotion. <sighs> I displeased God. I did something out of his will. I forgot, I, I, I forgot to do what he said to do. <sighs> I feel bad. I, I wish I didn't do that. I regret doing that because all I wanna do is please God every day. That's good. That's good. That's a good emotion. And that's a godly emotion. And that's a godly emotion of regret. Like we see God have that regret. This is a godly emotion. And um, this is where, this is conviction. I'm actually describing conviction, how conviction should be like, what it should feel like. Regret, heart deeply troubled sometimes because it, it pains you to, to displease God. But um, the devil loves to hijack in this area, though. In this beautiful moment of godly regret, godly heart troubled, godly conviction that's going to lead to repentance, in that, um, in that place, the devil loves to come and hijack. This is one of the biggest ways that he comes to try to hijack this emotion and bring a different kind of emotion. Um, and that's condemnation. But it says Jesus 
in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. So that means that, look, God knows that we're not perfect. He knows that we will make mistakes and that doesn't bother him. So when you make a mistake, God isn't shocked. He isn't um, so angry at you. He, he, I mean, he, he, he's expecting some mistakes along the way. He, it, you're on the journey to be transformed. So um, he's, he's not condemning. That's not his heart to be like, how could you? You're so bad. I can't believe you did this. I'm so shocked. I don't even know what to do. That's not God. That's not God. Um, God's not surprised. And God knows that this is part of your transformation, a part of your transformation journey. And God just wants to see that you see you have wronged. He wants to see that you care about that, that you're not indifferent, that, that, it, that it troubled you. He wants to see that you have regret. He wants to see that you are hearing his conviction. Um, I don't want you to do that again. I want you to go this way instead. Um, he, wants, he wants that, okay? But he doesn't want you to condemn yourself he doesn't want you to see him wrongly and see him as so angry. The devil likes to point God as someone who's scary. When you do something wrong, the devil tries to make you think that God is like scary, like a, a abusive parent, like an abusive parent, you know, or even, you know, an abusive uh, boyfriend or girlfriend or any, an abusive relationship, right? That's what like the devil likes to, uh, put uh, uh, the wrong view of what God is doing on you so that you're seeing God so angry with you. Like, I don't even want to look at you. I'm ashamed of you. Just go away until I can cool down and think about forgiving you. Like that's what the devil tries to put in your mind of what God is doing when you make a mistake. But that's a complete lie. That is what the devil was doing with Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, um, they, they felt so much shame. They felt condemnation. They felt shame and they thought God was looking at them like gross and like, ew, you're gross. Um, that you did this, you're so gross and filthy. And that's why they covered, that's why they all of a sudden saw themselves as naked. They didn't see themselves as naked before. And then the devil, devil made them think that God was saying, you're gross, you should cover up because I don't even want to look at you because I'm so ashamed with you and it's so gross what you did. Uh, that's why they cover themselves up and hid. And they hid also because the devil was putting on them um, the wrong perception of God, that God was, um, you know, I don't know, just going to destroy them or something because he was so angry, so they better hide. <sighs> Completely the lie of the devil. And that's why God says, who told you you were naked? And so in those moments when we feel so disgusted with, if you feel so disgusted with yourself, if you feel so like dirty and filthy and you feel so ashamed that you feel like you want to go far from God because you don't even want to, um, you, you don't want him to see you. So you just want time to pass and not even maybe think about God or something like that, you know, um, that's the devil doing the same exact thing as he did to Adam and Eve. It's a complete lie. Um, like I said, God is not surprised. God is not ashamed of you. Um, we, God has, gr <laughs> this is his abundant grace. This is his abundant grace. And so we need to have grace for ourselves. We need to, um, you know, see ourselves rightly. And, and, and when you have really made, if that's really your heart and you've done the spiritual work to make that intention, that your biggest passion and mission and intention is to please God, you need to understand that, like, that's the real you. That's the real you, not the mess up that you see yourself being. That pure heart, that's, that's you. And, and we, we are going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. We all make, every one of us has made mistakes. And so um, you're not this only one out there and who is like disgusting or something you are just like everyone else okay so have grace upon yourself god isn't surprised he 
he loves you so much. His love has not changed. His love has not changed at all. And he just wants you to see him as, as so loving. The, the way that you should always see God whenever you make a mistake is to see him as the father of the prodigal son. There's a story in the Bible of a son, prodigal son, who um, just was so sinful and um, just was just horrible to his parents and um, took his inheritance, took the money and wasted it and lived a worldly life and and he came back and instead of the father being like, I'm, I, I don't even want to see you ever again, you know, or instead of like scowling at him and giving him a guilt trip and like, you know, the first time he sees him, you know, being like, do you know how how much harm you caused me? You know, you should be so disappointed. Da, da, da. He doesn't do any of that. In the story, his arms are wide open and his arms are wide open as soon as he sees him and he throws a huge party. Like it would be this lavish party in those days, expensive party, um, like with what they ate, with the um, the animal that they ate. Like that was like huge deal, fancy party. So that's how we should always see God whenever we have these moments where we made a mistake and God's lead, uh, leading us to now repent to come into his arms. Uh, so, um, you know, th that's how you manage these emotions. When you feel, it's, it's good to feel regret, but just don't stay there. You stay there for a moment so that you can have a genuine apology to God. And um, it, it's a good emotion to have, by the way, too, because when, when you feel that regret and that hurt that you've displeased God, it really puts a fire in you, a bigger passion uh, to please God. Uh, it makes you to take it seriously. It amps up that passion and amps up that seriousness. You become more conscientious. You know, um, if he speaks, you write it down. You don't forget. You meditate on it again. If he says to obey him soon, you don't treat it as something uh, not valuable, in, but, but, but you value it so much and you're like, oh, I must do this before everything else. God says to do this soon, so I must do it now. Rather than like not valuing it, putting it on the back burner, going about your day and completely forgetting what God told you to do. So it puts that fire in you where it makes you to have more reverence, more respect for God, treat him more as a king, as your king, and um, give him that respect, uh, you know, to, ob to obey him quickly and take it so seriously, everything he's calling you to do. So that's why this emotion is a good godly emotion. It, it leads to that. It leads to more of a, a, a reverence for God and more of a passion for God, a fire, a fire is lit in you. I don't ever want to displease God again. I just want to please him every single day. That's, that's all I want. Hallelujah. If you start to feel that condemnation coming on, just recognize it. You need, like, this teaching will help you. You know, you'll recognize it when it comes. You'll recognize those thoughts and feelings you're having of, like, how could I do this? I'm, I'm bad. I'm disgusting. I'm dirty. I'm ashamed. I don't want to read the Bible or pray because I'm just so ashamed. I don't want to you know, be in God's presence. When you start to feel those feelings, that's when you'll know the devil is literally coming in your feelings and you need to reject him. You need to renew your mind. You need to read the story of the, uh, the story of the prodigal son. Read that, meditate on that, meditate on this. This is how God really is. This is how he wants me to see him as. This is what he's doing right now in my life. And reject the devil, reject the, say, I, I reject every, uh, feeling and thought of condemnation right now. I reject all of that and, and run to Jesus. Anytime you're feeling like you don't want to run to Jesus, know that's the devil. The devil trying to put shame, trying to make you, you where you're not feeling like you want to spend time with God because of you know what you did. Reject that and run hard and fast to Jesus. So now we're going to go to when Jesus weeped. We hear, we, we read in the Bible about how Jesus weeped when his great friend Lazarus 
died, but then he rose him from the grave. And so, you know, Jesus had full faith that this was going to happen. Um, and he knew he would shortly see his see Lazarus again. Um, but in the moment, you know, he's fully human, fully, 100% fully God, fully human. But in the moment, you know, it's someone he was very close to and he loved deeply. And the fact was, was he was literally dead. So that is going to um, bring sadness to anybody. Uh, even, even if you may see them again shortly, I mean, the fact that he has died is going to bring sadness to any human who really loves. And also the, the, it's going to bring sadness and pain to see, pain in the heart, to see your beloved disciples and friends like Mary and Martha, his siblings, um, to see them so distraught because they loved him so much, to see them just in such pain is going to make any human feel very sad, feel sad. And so this is why we see Jesus weep. And so to feel sad is not a bad thing um, in general. It's not a bad thing. Um, and so there will be time, as the Bible says, there's a time to mourn. There's a time to grieve. There is a time. The Bible talks of that. There is a time. And, you know, when you love someone so much and you lose them or you maybe you move far away from them or something, um, you know, you'll feel sadness. And it's because you love so much. And that's okay to feel that. That's okay to feel that. It's okay to cry. Jesus wept. It's okay to cry um, when you're sad, uh, but this is the big but. Um, God never wants you to stay in sadness for long. And the biggest thing when it comes to sadness is that faith has to be before the emotion. Faith has to come before the emotion, uh, meaning you shouldn't be led by the emotion you can have the emotion, but faith needs to be more powerful. Your faith needs to be more powerful. What I mean by that is, um, let's say um, you lose someone close to you in your life that you love so much. You feel sadness, but you have faith. Let's say it's someone who loved God. You have faith that they are in heaven, that they are in a better place than where they were, they're with Jesus and they're in the most joyous place in the entire world that they are so happy. You have faith. So you aren't stuck in this place of sadness where you are, you know, just like thinking about yourself and how it really stinks that you can't have them anymore in your life. You know, you don't dwell on that so much. But this is where you, you, you put your image of God on, of being selfless and having faith. Selfless and having faith. Having faith that they are in a better place. So that, that can make you happy. That can make you happy, you know. Not full, full sad. Um, but also, also faith that, you know, life will go on. And your life will be beautiful, even if that person isn't on this earth anymore. Faith that God truly fills you with contentment and is your very best friend, that you don't need a human to, to, fill, that to fill that void if this is someone you are very close to. It's not them that, that fills the void. And if they have been, then you have faith that it's time to allow God to fill that void and when he fills that void, I will have more joy and peace than if any human, and contentment if any, than if any human was filling that void. Because God is the only one that's supposed to fill that void. And you just trust and have faith that all of the places that that person made your life so beautiful and blessed and full, that God will bring other blessings and other people that will bring those the, the, the beauty, the beauty and the, the joy and the happiness that that person brought. So you don't stay in this place of sadness like my life will 
never be as good again. I will not have friendship like this again. I will not be as happy again. You, you don't have all of those feelings. You, 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 if they come, you, you need to reject them. This is where the devil is trying to come. He's trying to bring depression. He's trying to bring darkness. He's trying to bring um, a, a, a sorrow and sadness not from God. He's trying to take you into a dark place where every day you wouldn't feel joy, but you would have depression. And this is how he begins, is by infiltrating your emotions with this, this feeling like, I don't see how my life could be as great as it was before this. Um, so this is when losing someone's death, or even maybe it's a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, or maybe it's there was a falling out with a friend, or maybe a whole community, or maybe you moved far away from everybody close to you in life. This, all that I'm saying now, applies just the same. So when faith is first, the, it will never allow sadness to stay for long. Sadness is okay for a time, a time of grieving, a time of mourning, um, a time when something, your heart is hurt by something, that's okay. But it, it shouldn't stay there. We are called to be the light of the world, and we cannot be the light of the world when we are in sadness every day. We will be the light of the world when we are showing the perfect peace that we are living in, that Jesus has given us. When we are living the life of abundant joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength that we are so strong in joy, and people see us, wow, that joy, that peace, what is that? That is being the light of the world. When you're staying in sadness, that is when you're looking like the people, people in the world and not being the light. Once you start to feel the emotion of sadness, he wants to take you down an identity place, like, like transforming your identity to be a victim and to feel sorry for yourself, and to get pity from others, and sometimes to get attention from others, because you want um, you're, you want you want people to try to take the sadness away. So that's that's when it's the wrong kind of sadness. You, you need to know this is a godly sadness, and God will lift it and take all my sorrow and take my grief and fill me with supernatural peace and joy. Um, sometimes people, when they are sad and go into that place of a victim or have pity on me, um, it's, a, it's a form of like human pleasure and gratification that they are, they're trying to get pleasure and uh, fleshly pleasure in that way. And so the devil will, ha will take them causing them to get more and more sad, more and more dark, more and more depressed. The devil will influence their emotions where they're desiring sadness now. They're desiring sad movies. They're desiring um, sad music. They're desiring to be a Debbie Downer. They're desiring to speak negatively. They're desiring to not be positive and not be of faith. That's when you know the devil's influencing the emotions. Um, so uh, Jesus says, to, you can choose life or death. Choose life. The devil, when sadness comes, can see this sometimes as an opportunity to get you to try to choose death, to get you to try to choose darkness. So you have to be wise in these moments when, when the sadness comes to analyze that emotion, put on your new self. You know, you don't have to suppress the tears. You don't have to suppress the sadness, but... Um, be very vigilant with how the devil is going to try to use this opportunity to try to keep this sadness to, to stay in you. Um, we shouldn't really feel sorry for ourselves. We have, to, <laughs> we have to be careful of this when things get hard serving God. Um, I remember there was times in the wilderness for me when I was in the wilderness for years, you know, before I reached the promised land of seeing prophecies and promises come to pass in my life and the promised land of 
seen uh, God move in power and revival break out. For years, I didn't see that. For about four years, I was waiting and believing in the promise and working hard and doing uncomfortable things, doing things that were really hard for me and not fun. Like, I never wanted to preach, and preaching was very, very uncomfortable for me for a long time. For many years, it was very uncomfortable um, and not fun. And so for four years, what I was doing was really not fun (laughs) and really uncomfortable, um, but it was the most peace and joy and contentment I've ever had because it was the most in God's will I've ever been. And it was in the place I knew I was touching God's heart more than ever in my life. So that brought more intimacy with God than ever. And when you are in God's will, when you are touching his heart, that is what fills the void. When you're having intimacy and you're in his will, touching his heart, serving, obeying him, that's what fills that uh, void of, that void that every human has, that void of, uh, wanting contentment and purpose and love. So it was the most amazing years in that respect. That's, that's what matters above all. That's, it's not the success that brings contentment. It's not the promised land that brings contentment, the true contentment. It's intimacy with God and being in his will, loving him back, loving him the way he wants through obedience, serving him. Um, but anyways, like when it was uncomfortable and, and not fun, there were tears. There were tears. There were times I just longed for promises and I would cry and I would, I would hear sometimes God say, don't stay there. Don't stay there. Like I know it's hard, but don't stay there. Don't feel sorry for yourself because in the wilderness, When God's taking you through a hard time on purpose, the refining fire, it's very easy to feel sorry for yourself. It's tempting to feel sorry for yourself. And when you start to feel sorry for yourself, that's when you're like crying and crying and you're having the wrong perspective. I mean, you're just thinking that your life stinks when in reality you are literally perfectly in God's will, you are in preparation time to be fulfilling, completely fulfilling your purpose on this earth, to receive the promises. Um, You know, it's like, I mean, it's kind of like this. It's like, you know, there's college, there's school, there's, there's school, there's elementary, middle, high school, college, and then the career. And so, if the dream of the, you know, the dream, the exciting time is to be a doctor or something or a lawyer or a teacher, whatever. Um, but you, you don't get there right away. And the, the, the school is not hard, is not uh, fun lots of times. You know, the people pulling all-nighters studying and all that and, and not getting paid and, you know, just all this work and not getting any re- recompense or whatever you know, from it, (laughs) it's like that, like, but like you, you have to go through that and it's it's exciting. It's like you're one step closer to the dream of the career or whatever. So it's like that in the spiritual realm, you know, you're right on track. It's necessary. You have to go through it and it's exciting. You're one step closer to the dream, the promised land. It's, it's not a bad thing. But in the middle of the wilderness, we can lack the right spiritual perspective. The devil can come and try to speak to, try to blind us of that proper spiritual perspective and and make you feel like, you know, like Joseph in the prison in the pit. You know, he was on his way. He was getting closer and closer to the dream coming to pass. But instead, you could see yourself as, I am in a prison. I am in a pit. This stinks. This is awful. My life is horrible. I didn't deserve this. I'm having to go through this. I don't deserve this. The devil will try to come with that perspective when we can be so silly sometimes. Like, you know, you, you're living what you prayed for. You, you prayed for th- these promises of God to come to pass. You said, God, do whatever you need to do to uh, mold me, to be a powerful vessel of you, do whatever, you you know, you prayed these prayers, but, and this is the answer. (laughs) 
and we're like, whoa, it's me. And we can look so silly. So sometimes in those moments where we're like, we're feeling sad, it's okay to feel sad. Like this is hard. This is uncomfortable. This is a little painful. It's okay to feel sad, to cry a little bit, but we, we have to make sure that we aren't letting the devil hijack that emotion and, and victim, pity. Why is this happening to me? I don't deserve this. Nobody sees all that I do. You know, that's just the devil trying to come and bring you away from God's will. Um, when that comes, you lack motivation to do God's work. You lack motivation for God. You lack passion for God. You're, you lose your fire for God. You start to seek God as the bad guy. Uh, and you can give up. You can start to feel no ambition. You feel tired. And you just feel like, what am I even doing? You, you think, you know, it's like the same thing every day. You feel like you're going backwards. When in reality, you're right on track. You're one step closer. You're right smack in God's will. But the devil tries to come in these areas of the sadness that you're feeling in the place of wilderness. Um, you know, in the place of people persecuting you and doing mean things to you. How could they do this to me? You know, the devil try to come in that area and bring sadness uh, to try to lead you from God's will, to try to take you away, to try to get you to give up and lose your fire for God and the work he's called you to do. So you have to be aware of that. In your place of wilderness, in your place of refining fire, in your place of uncomfortable and unfun times of the will of God, that's how it is. Sometimes the will of God is not fun and is uncomfortable. So when you're in those times, <laughs> when you're in those seasons, be aware, be aware of, you know, those tears you cry, that's, o- that's okay, and God sees you, see it as, as see the, as this moment of God see, saying, I'm proud of you, comforting you, I'm proud of you, you're doing a good job, I'm so proud of you, uh, the promises are going to come to pass, I'm getting you through this, I'm fighting the battles for you, uh, see him in that way, wiping your tears, it's okay, cry, and, but, but, but see him wiping your tears, and have that faith, that's why I say put the faith at the forefront, Put the faith, have the spiritual eyes. That has to come before the emotions. Don't let the emotions lead, but let the faith lead. So then you'll, you'll, you'll tear up, you'll cry a little bit, but you allow God to wipe your tears and you stand strong and you s- renew your mind. You put on your new self. You see in the spiritual realm. I got this with God. Amen. Oh, also when we're talking about like someone you're in love with and... They, um, they leave you, what have you, uh, you have to really put, I mean, you have to really put your faith first in this area. The devil's going to want to really try to overtake you with emotions of sadness. I'm so in love. I'll never find another. God's in control. God is your protector. He could be protecting you right now by closing this door. You got to be open to that. You got to see spiritually, putting your faith first. God's in control. God's never going to give you someone that, God's never going to allow someone to be with you uh, who will mistreat you. Like if you are surrendered to God and you're like, Lord, I just want the person I marry uh, to be, to be us to be equally yoked, him, him or her to love you with all his or her heart. That's all I want, Lord. And I just want to be in your will. I just want to be in your will. That's all I want your timing, everything. If, if, you, if God has that surrender from you, then God is going to be so good to protect you from the wrong people. But when you're in love, when your emotions are so strong, it's very hard to see that this person isn't right. And so God can cause things to end. He can shut doors on those relationships. Um, so in these areas, you need to wake up. You need to see if God is allowing this, if God is shutting this door, then this means that he has better. This means he's, he's protecting me. This means he's making the way for his will to be done. You have faith, you get over it, you be strong, and you reject the devil trying to come in those emotions with sadness. All right, now moving on to anger. We see the righteous anger from God in the word. And even in the scripture, uh, this is in Ephesians. I, for, I didn't get to write down the exact chapter, but I know it's verse 26. Be angry and yet do not sin. 
Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity or a foothold. So this, what's interesting about this scripture is it says, be angry, yet do not sin. <laughs> so it's saying that anger can be okay. Anger can be a godly emotion. We see God having righteous anger throughout the word of God. He has righteous anger uh, with his enemies. He has righteous anger when his children disobey him, go against him horribly and do evil things, worship other gods, we see the righteous anger of God. So uh, we should have anger against sin. We should have anger against evil. We should have anger against mistreatment that an injustice that people ha- that people go through. We should have anger when people blaspheme God. We should have anger when um, we should have anger at the dis- trying to destruct and destroy the work of God that people do. There, there should be anger towards that. There should not, but we are called to love everybody. We are called to love everyone. We are called to love our enemies. So where we have to be careful is to not let that anger be concentrated on a person, be towards a person. This is where the faith has to come first. We need to see it in the spiritual realm first. The devil is behind all of this. The devil is behind the injustice. The devil is behind behind the mistreatment, the abuse. The devil is behind why people are doing evil things, why people are mean to you, why people did bad things to other people. The devil's behind that. Lots of times that people literally have demons controlling them. Uh, We can't expect people who don't know the love of God to not be evil. We can't expect that. I mean, obviously. And so we shouldn't be angry at these people. We should be angry at the devil. We should be angry at the sin. Uh, So that's where the difference is. We shouldn't be angry at a person. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Don't be angry at the person and stay angry at the person Stop being worldly, carnal. This is how people in the world are. They get angry at people and they do mean things to them. They lash out. They speak words of death. They backstab. They do bad things. We should never be angry at the person so that everything else follows. And then we we sin and we do bad things and we speak words of death over people. Um, but rather, our anger should be at the devil, uh, and at the same time, we shouldn't we shouldn't let the anger towards the devil overtake us. We shouldn't let the anger towards the devil overtake our faith. Meaning, we have the anger, but above that, we have faith that God is in control, that God is a God of justice that God laughs at his enemies, that God removes those who go against him, Uh, that what people sow they will reap. Not that we want them to reap, not that we want harm to come upon their lives, but what I mean is we can rest knowing that God is a God of justice and that it's it's not like people are just getting away with doing evil. It's not like the devil's getting away with doing evil. God is in control. He is king. The devil has been defeated. Um, and, 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 and so we need to see ourselves and other people, if they are true children of God, if they're really surrendered to God, we can rest knowing that for ourselves and for others, God will protect them. God will fight their battles for them and will be victorious. God is in control and there's victory. There's going to be, there's going to be, um, a a day of justice. There's going to be abundant life for you and other people because, because sometimes you feel anger because it's yourself that injustice is happening to that persecution, false accusations are coming towards that wrong things are being done at you. You feel anger and you feel like this isn't fair. How can this be done to me? Um, And you just stay 
stay in that place of anger. When God doesn't want you to stay in that place of anger, when that's happening to you, you can have anger, but towards the sin and the devil, and for a moment, not for a long time. Um, and your anger shouldn't be from a selfish place. Your anger should be about what the devil's doing towards God. Like if you are a servant of God, if you are a minister, for example, you will go through persecution. You will go through many, many false accusations spoken against you. You will have people do what they did to Jesus, where they will say you're using demonic powers to cast out demons. They will say all sorts of lies about you. They will do so many mean things to you. They'll be backstabbings. They'll be Judases that betray you. Uh, there will be lies made up. There will be evil things that you couldn't imagine people could be so evil when you really serve God in the anointing. Uh, be, because, I mean, that's just the Bible. The Bible comes alive. I mean, how can people be so evil to kill Jesus? If you really think about it, he, if you put together the most kind and loving, generous, world-changing people in the entire world that ever existed and you combine them all together, that still doesn't equal Jesus. <laughs> you know, like, he did, not, he did no sin. He sinned not one time. He transformed people with his love and his power and took away their sicknesses, took away their demons, and brought them abundant life and gave them salvation. So that's all he did. So he was guilty 0%, and he wasn't like the normal person that maybe just doesn't do much or something in that time. You know, they're just, they're not really harming many people, but they're not really doing much good. No, he was doing so much good, and yet he was crucified because he was found guilty. He was found guilty based on false accusations, evil false accusations saying that he was from the devil when it's literally the opposite. So, man, it's just so, it's so wicked. It's so evil. Like, it's so unimaginable. You know, you think you've seen a lot of wickedness and evil today, but imagine if you were in the times of Jesus. Imagine if Jesus was here today physically, you know, and we were witnessing that. We were, imagine if you were with Jesus, like the disciples were every single day and being like in awe of his love and like, you are the gift to the world. Like, I can't, you, he, is, he is filling you with love and peace and joy every day. And then you witness what these Pharisees are saying of, against him. And then you witness them take him to trial and, um, and, 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 and allow for, uh, uh, when, when, when the choice is, should we allow um, this person to live who's done horrible crimes or should we um, allow Jesus to live? And they say, kill Jesus and allow the criminal to live. Like, I mean, it's just really wicked and really evil. Like, like unimaginable wicked and evil. Like, that doesn't, like, you can't comprehend. Like, that, that's what happened to Jesus. So guess what? The Bible's coming alive today. Revival's now. When Jesus in his fullness, I mean, Jesus who comes in power, when he is put in vessels and put in ministries and, it, man, it, the Bible comes alive. I mean, the devil, it, it was the devil behind the Pharisees. It was the devil all behind all of those evil, wicked things that, that happened to Jesus. So same devil, same devil with same tricks, same tricks of evil, same schemes of evil, same schemes of evil of trying to destroy, destroy, destroy um, ministries, destroy reputations, destroy, assassinate one's character, um, make up lies. He's the father of lies. Make up complete lies out of thin air. Um, say r such evil, ridiculous things like this minister is using demonic powers to cast out demons. You know that that's gonna happen. That's gonna happen. So um, so yeah. When you become an anointed vessel, you're gonna your eyes are gonna open up to how evil the devil is. You're gonna be shocked at the evilness and wickedness. Uh, you see, usually Christians do, which is really shocking too, because. It's, it, it's like worse than the world <laughs> so, many times. I mean, and, and I mean that's, what, that's how it was with the Pharisees. They were the godly people, yet they were the ones that killed Jesus. So they did literally more wicked and evil things, like unimaginable wicked and evil things than the people that weren't the people of God. <laughs> but the Bible comes alive. You start to see just wickedness happen from so-called Christians um, 
towards anointed ministers, ministries. Uh, so when it's yourself and that's happening, okay, uh, you'll feel the righteous anger, but you should not feel selfishly anger. Um, it's true that it's not right what they're doing to you as a person and you didn't deserve it. That's true. That's true. But you are a servant of God. Nothing's about you. Everything's about God. All you do is for God. The work, the ministry, it's for God. It's not your ministry. It's not your work. It's God's work. You're just a servant. So all that they're attacking is actually attacking the work of God, is attacking God himself. And you need to see it that way. And so you should have righteous anger at what they're doing to God, not what they're doing to you. You shouldn't take it personally. The only reason they're attacking you is because of God in you. They're attacking God, not you. I mean, really, they're trying to stop the work of God. You are the vessel, so yes, they're trying to stop you, but they're trying to stop you because of the work of God that comes forth through you. So um, you should not take it selfish because that's when we become worldly, like, I don't deserve this. Forget what you don't deserve. We're servants of God. It was told that we would have persecution, so don't be woe is me, victim, um, God told us this would happen. The real tragedy, the real thing we should be angry at is not how could they do this to me, but the tragedy of how could they do this to God? The, sad, the sadness and the anger of that. How could they do this to God, his work, his anointing? Um, you know, because they're doing this evil, people will be led astray and won't come, won't come to Jesus. They'll go to hell. Um, because these people are doing this, um, people will lose the deliverance they've received. They'll get more demons. Because these people are doing this, this is going to cause people to blaspheme the Holy Spirit and call what's God of the devil, call what's good evil, and cause them to go to hell. Blaspheme the Holy Spirit, unforgivable sin. Um, because they're doing this, um, they're causing so many people's eyes to not open and be in skepticism and not come and receive true salvation, healing, and deliverance. Your heart and your emotions and your anger should be there. That you're angry that, 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 that the devil's doing this to God, his work, speaking against God, and keeping, trying to, and trying to stop the work of God and, and, and causing damage. God, God heals and restores, but the truth is, is that there, there is damage that's caused from that, you know. There is damage. Um, so your anger is not towards yourself. You don't think of yourself at all. Your anger is towards the devil, what he's doing to God. So that makes you to not feel like um, you need to be eye for eye for somebody. It makes you to not um, feel like you're so important. How could they do this to me? That's the wrong mindset. It, it makes you to not be defensive because God's not calling you to be defensive. He's calling you to rest in him, be humble, keep doing the work of God while he fights the battles for you. So you're able to do that when you're not selfishly having anger because of what people are doing to you. You know, it was done to God, but God wants me to focus on him, do his work, and he's going to fight the battles. Okay. But when you get that selfish anger, that's when so much people get offended. People want to lash out. People want to um, defend themselves. So that's, that's the wrong anger. Um, and same for other people too. So if you're seeing um, this uh, the devil attacking other people, maybe your spiritual mother or father, you know, have the righteous anger at the devil, what he's doing to God, not towards the person. Um, and this righteous anger can be a good thing because it's similar to the regret. The regret can, and the conviction can lead to more passion, more reverence for God, more seriousness. So it's like you see, you, you see how serious the devil is. You see how busy he is at work. You know, you see how he's busy scheming and using people to try to destroy the work of God. And so that actually, you know, you feel anger, but you're like, well, I need to work harder for God. I need to stand up for God more. 
I need to testify more. And you start to realize, you start to see the things that will actually make the kingdom of God to advance. Testify. You start to see the things that will make the kingdom of God win over the devil's attacks. Like if we're talking specifically about the devil attacking the work of God, you should have righteous anger and it should fuel a passion in you to be on fire for God's work and be unashamed of God and his work. Be unashamed of his anointing. Be unashamed of your testimony and go to work and do everything you can to get your testimony out because to, 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 be, to show good fruits, to bear good fruits of God's work, of his anointing. Uh, you know, it's like the, the devil is trying to throw dirt, trying to throw so much dirt on the work of God, on a ministry, on a minister. He's trying to splatter so much dirt so it looks ugly. So what, when you share your testimony, when you um, or get serious about it and, and, you know, and you invite people and you just, you, you, you make it so serious, the work of God, you start to bring beautiful fruit and it, and it, it removes the dirt. It removes the stains it, as you bring the beautiful, beautiful fruit to see you stand up for God and his work. Okay, next I want to go over happiness, joy, Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you and his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. God rejoices. He rejoices over you. He, he, ha he has so much joy over you that he even sings. So God is full of joy. He rejoices. He feels joy. He feels, he feels this. And so um, we will feel joy. But, you know, there's a worldly happiness. There's a worldly pleasure and satisfaction. And then there's a godly joy. So this is the difference. And this is where we have to make sure we're not getting happiness from the world. And we also, there's a certain area I want to talk about. Um, we have to make sure even when we're not getting pleasures from the world anymore, you know, we're not getting pleasures from bad movies, from drugs and alcohol, from sex. We're not, you know, we're not, we're not there anymore, right? You're not there anymore, but you still need to be aware of what's bringing you happiness, okay? By that, I mean there's one area people need to watch out of is success. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be happy for success in the wrong way. So God will bring success. God will bring promises to pass. God will bring godly elevation. And we should feel such joy there. But the joy we feel there should be joy in our God that he is faithful. Joy that God has lifted us for his glory. He's lifted you for his glory and for his purpose. And so him lifting you means that the kingdom is expanding. That more people will be brought to Jesus and come to him. And that's why you have the joy. Where we have to be careful is that we're not having happiness because of the same reason people in the world have happiness when they have success, when it comes to success. Like, so, I mean, some, sometimes believers, they still have in their heart man's approval. They want man's approval. They want to be liked. They want to be seen as important. They want to be seen as successful. They want people to see exciting things that they're doing. And so then when God lifts, when God brings that, sometimes people will feel so happy. But the reason they're feeling so happy is because of wrong motives, is because they're happy that people are seeing them as successful now. They're happy that they look really important and really cool and really good and really awesome. So we have to monitor our hearts uh, with, you know, our, our joy. You know, you're, you, if you are feeling like you're not having joy in a wilderness, if you're feeling you're not having joy when you're, you're not seeing elevation, you're not seeing promises fulfilled, and, like, that's the real reason you're not having joy, that's something you need to really realize what's going on this isn't good, you know, this is wrong, I'm having wrong motivations, and I, I, my joy should be in my relationship with God, in my intimacy with God, and being in his will. So that means that if I'm in the wilderness, I should have such joy. 
if I don't have the promises yet, if I don't have certain desires in my heart yet, that shouldn't affect my joy. It shouldn't be determined upon my joy. Uh, it, th- these are the icings on the cake. These are the sweet blessings from God, but not the necessary vital things that produces joy. So, you know, in the moments of success, if you start to feel that, if you start to feel like, oh, yes, I'm so excited how people will see me. You're feeling that? Be aware of that. Catch that. Realize this is a wrong kind of happiness. This is a wrong motive here. Reject it. Repent. Come to God. Be open and honest. Let him see you naked. Let him purify your heart. Um, And it's amazing. Once that happens, there's like no pressure for things to succeed. There's no pressure. There's no pressure. You're thinking about um, when this... If this succeeds here, then I'm so happy because it's for God's kingdom that, that God's people will receive more from him. This work that I'm doing, this project that I'm doing, this thing that God's calling me to do. Um, but if it doesn't succeed, well, it just wasn't God's time yet for a thing that, that God's having me do succeed for, for people to receive him through. It's just that it's time yet. This is part of the refining fire still, but that's okay. You know, <laughs> so it's not that pressure of like, oh, I hope this goes well. I hope this door opens because only then will I look important and my dreams of people seeing me, seeing me successful will come true. You don't have any of that in you, but you're just, your, your, your joy isn't based on any of that. And when you do have the success, it's your joy is in what it's doing for God, not what you're getting out of it. Amen. And lastly, I want to talk about love. God is love. And we see John 3, 16, God loved the world that he gave his ones, his only son. So we're going to have love. We're going to have natural emotions of love. Um, when it comes romantically, we have to really be careful because the devil wants to make us fall in love with the wrong people. The devil wants to overcome our emotions. And it, and it doesn't feel wrong because love is such a good thing. That's where we have to be so careful. Um, and we can feel so strongly. We can feel like the most love we've ever felt for somebody, but it could be just they're not the one that they're, they're not equally yoked. They're... They actually have open doors to the devil and it's going to cause just destruction in your life and it's not going to help you be in God's will for your life. So you have to be aware of that. You have to be aware that our feelings can be so fleeting, Uh, especially when it comes to love. You know, people can fall in love with people's looks so much and it tricks them. They think they're so in love with the person, but they're in love with the looks. They become so in love with the idea. They think they're in love with the person, but they're really in the in love with the idea of actually getting married. They're in love with the idea that um, everything matches up. The list they had, the check, they they have the hair color, the eye color, the height, the love for kids, the athleticism, the um, church background, um, same acti- same same passion and activities, and it's like. Oh my gosh, wow, I can't believe it. This is the list I had since I was a kid. And they're in love with the idea. They're in love with the fact that it matches their list and they're not even really in love with a person, but they're so confused in their mind because the devil's come and played games with those emotions, brought deceit. And so you think you're in love with the person, but you're not. Uh, so emotions can go really the wrong way when it comes to love, ro- loving romantically. So this is where you have to really walk in wisdom and make sure you're not jumping to conclusions, jumping at signs. And um, God will speak so many times in common sense, but when our emotions of love romantically are so high, it can just cloud over the simple voice of God speaking in wisdom and truth and speaking in common sense type things like the person has open doors to the devil, Uh, like um, 
you're not really actually equally yoked, <laughs> you know, or like this person is a lot of talk that he's Christian, that she's Christian, but deep down they don't really have that real heart for God. It's easy to look past all those things. So you have to really um, just really desire God's will above all else. And whenever you start to feel love, start to feel emotions of love romantically, you have to stop, slow down, and really come to God, surrender it to God, and be real with God and be real, Lord, I just want your will. Please help me if I like my emotions are getting wild. Help, help me. Um, I just want to be in your will. I just want to hear your voice. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. So those were some emotions I, I wanted to go through with you all, give you practical applications uh, of how to know how to really, how to manage your emotions, put on your new self. So the key really is to put on your new self, renew your mind with the word of God so you can know God's character. Above all, putting as I said in the beginning, making it your biggest passion and goal mission to please God, to obey him, to be in his will. Because then even when you're feeling certain things, you're automatically going to, I want to please God right now with my emotions. Even my emotions, I want them to be godly emotions. I, 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 want, to, I want to think how God thinks, feel, God, feel how God feels. You make that your intention and, and God helps you. He helps you. He helps you recognize this is from the devil, reject it. So um, those, are, those are the big keys. Renew your mind with the word of God and be surrendered and be planted where God's power is. Receive meaty teaching like this that's anointed, that will help you, that will help, help you to learn more and more God's character, his heart, godly emotions, and that will just open up your spiritual eyes more and more and more and more. So you can be able to perfectly discern when the devil's trying to come in your emotions or when it's godly emotion and what to do with your emotions. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to declare over everybody right now, everyone watching right now, I declare every way the devil has tried to come in your emotion, emotions and has led you down the wrong path, even right now. I declare that scheme of the devil to be exposed to you right now, and I declare all of that darkness that the devil has put in your heart, put in the emotions, it must come out in Jesus' name. And I declare this anointing to come upon you, and may you have a fire like never before, to be in God's will, to please God, to feel how he feels, to please him with everything you do, to please him with your emotions, to please him with your actions, to please him with your words. And may you walk in wisdom in Jesus' name. May you have this discernment to never be led astray by the devil again through the emotions. May you have the strength and wisdom to reject the devil as he comes in your thoughts and emotions. And may you have the strength to feel how God feels, how to, to please him every single moment in Jesus' name. I speak peace and joy to fill you, abundant peace and joy and all sadness, sorrow to be lifted from you in Jesus' name. All anger, spirits of anger and rage must go in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh,